Okay. So I'm happy to welcome everyone who is tuning in as well. Uh, but for those of you who are here in person, uh, you should have found on your seat a clipboard, and on that there's a little blue sheet with some very simple questions. Um, if you could fill that out, that information is really useful to us as we describe who's interested in attending our programs. Um, so if you fill that out, you can put it back on the clipboard and leave it under your seat. Um, it's really valuable in helping us uh, make a case for why new play development is important. Um, there's also a little envelope. As an organization devoted to the play rates process, the large raises 98% of our income from individuals and institutions that make it possible for us to keep all of our programming completely free for audiences to attend. So if you're in a position to make a contribution, whether it be $5 or a lot, lot more, uh, it all goes to providing transformative support to extraordinary playwrights. So you could just put that in the envelope. Don't put that under your seat. But there's a little uh, birdhouse uh, out by the door where you came in. Um, and you can slip the envelope right in there. Um, we'd like to send a special thanks to some of the funders who made Playwrights Week possible, including the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, in partnership with the City Council and the National Endowment of the Arts, with additional support from the New York State Council on the Arts and the Axe Houghton Foundation. I'd also like to acknowledge the large literary wing, which is a voluntary group of readers who each year evaluates all the plays we receive through our open access program. This year they read 948 plays towards selecting this slate of seven. So we are really proud of this process and of the fact that we invite anyone anywhere to submit their work in progress for consideration. If you have a play you'd like to submit, all the info is on our website. Um, so tonight's program should run under 90 minutes. And at a certain point, we hope to take questions from the audience and our Twitter audience. Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag theater talk, theater with an RE. So we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, and if you're, here, if you're here in person and you want to follow along on Twitter, I suppose you can do that. And, you can leave your phone, so, and then you can leave your phone on, but if everyone can make sure your phones are silenced, that would be really great. Uh, and once we've met the writers, we're going to open up a few bottles of wine in the lobby. Uh, in case you want to join us for a drink, do. Um, thank you again for coming to the Lark. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our Meet the Writers host. We're really, really thrilled to have her here. She's the literary director at the Signature Theater, and she was a member of the Playwrights Week Final Selection Committee that chose these seven plays. Our good friend, the brilliant Christy <laughs> wow. Evangelista. tonight. This is super exciting for me and for everyone at the LARC, of course, that is involved with this fabulous process. Um, as someone with a job like mine, I'm often asked to read plays and choose plays for various awards or commissions or readings and stuff like that. And um, over the years, I've really whittled it down to this one. This is a, a process and a, a week of playwrights that I really believe in and adore and love. And part of that is the exhaustive, thorough process that these readers go through. I mean, these, these plays are read several times, they are fought for, they are, they are loved for voraciously, and that's something that I really admire about how the LARP puts this group of plays together. And then something, I, I've, I've done this for a couple years now, and something that is really remarkable, remarkable about what happens is that even though you know there were 948 plays, and we've whittled them down to seven, there always seems to be this incredible synergy and sort of like-mindedness to the group that comes out and from that emerges from that process. And this is a group of, of seven very, very different people from different backgrounds and at different points in their careers. And yet somehow they're all writing plays that are about um, you know, how memories make us who we are, how, how our experiences make us who we are, and how um, we're a sort of collection of the relationships that we carry with us. And there's also something about these seven plays that I love that um, is very unafraid of how ugly people are and how <laughs> disgusting people can be. And there's, it's, every one of these plays, that is at play. So I think that that's really exciting that somehow through this really random organic process, this really beautiful synergy comes out in these people. And they've all met today for the first time. We just had a beautiful dinner at 5 o'clock in the room next door. Um, so they're just getting to know each other and getting to know what this process is and who the um, LARP staff are. And uh, we're really excited to embark upon this week and to get to know each other better and to hear from
from all of you and to hear from each other. So thank you guys all for being here and thank you all for showing up as well. So what's going to happen is I'm going to go through all seven of them and I'm going to ask them a couple sort of getting to know you questions, getting to know your play questions, and they're, they're, going, to, they're going to read short excerpts from their works for you. So you're actually going to get to hear the playwrights read from the plays. Rare and exciting, and I think delightful. So I'm really excited about that. Do not judge, just people love them. Um, and we're going to go in the order of their readings this week, so you can get a sense of how this week is going to play out by looking at this row of beautiful people next to me. Um, so let's start with the gorgeous Lauren Dee. Hello. Hello. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for being here with yeah. us. Um, your play is called The Tiger Among Us. And when is your reading on? Um, my reading is Wednesday at 3 p.m., so in two days. Right. Great. And you've already been rehearsing. Um, yeah, we have we have about like 10 hours of rehearsal throughout the entire process, and we're about maybe like seven hours in. So we right. have one more rehearsal on Wednesday. Oh, and by the way, I will be monitoring my cell phone for timekeeping purposes throughout this event. So do not think that I'm like texting or tweeting. <laughs> well, I, don't, I really want to. Um, so Lauren, one of my favorite lines of dialogue ever oh. is from this play. Uh -huh. It is, white people spend money on the dumbest shit. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great line. I totally get it. I know what you're saying. But my, my question for you is, what do you spend your money on? Or rather, if you had money, okay. what would you spend it on? <laughs> that is what I would do. Oh. Um, That's a great line. I, th I think my like husband and I were talking about this last night because he's like very anti-gift or very anti-thing. Like it's our anniversary tonight, and he was like, uh, was like <laughs> 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 um, and he, he was like, don't buy me anything, and like um, like your gift to me can be like that. I don't have to buy you anything. <laughs> um, and now and we're actually moving next week, so we're both like, oh, we hate how much stuff we have. Um, so I think, like, experiences, like, are a great way to spend your money. I read this article on how to um, elongate time and experience time um, in a more full way, and they talk about how if you want to feel like you've had a long day, do something different. So instead of like walking to work the same way you do, go a different path because your brain will map, um, will kind of map the different way and it'll feel like you've like gained extra time. Um, and so the way that I think it would be cool to approach life is that you spend your money on like new experiences because it will make it feel like you've actually had a longer life. Yeah. How are, what are you getting for your anniversary? Um, I think we're actually getting <laughs> out of time to know. But nothing, yeah. nothing. Just this fabulous yeah. dinner. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, and then to move on to the play. So even though this, this play is incredibly universal and large actually in scope, um, we were all really inspired by the very specific community of people that you're writing about and by perhaps a news story that inspired you to write the play. Can you talk a little bit about the origins of the play and about the particular community you're writing about? Yeah. So. Um, this play, The Tiger Among Us, is about uh, the Hmong American community that lives actually in Minnesota. Minnesota, for whatever reason, has the second largest uh, Hmong population in the United States. And a lot of these people came from Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. They were refugees. And they came to Minnesota because you had a lot of friendly Lutherans who were happy to have them. <laughs> and I kind of, um, I think it was like six years ago, found myself um, spending a month-long retreat in like outstate Minnesota um, during hunting season. And I think just being in that landscape, uh, in like this tiny town, um, really like was the setting for this play years later. Um, and while I was in Minnesota, I got to kind of know a lot of the Hmong American artists living there and really got interested in this like vibrant community that um, you know is like very uh, very supportive of one another like and just inexplicably in Minnesota oh and the uh, the article that you're referring to is um, I forget what exact year it was but maybe about 10 years ago um, there was a shooting 
um, in Wisconsin that um, background is that in the Hmong community they love they love hunting. Regular Midwesterners also really enjoy hunting, and that uh, throughout the years there's been a lot of tensions between the Hmong and white hunters out there. And this was an incident where a Hmong hunter was hunting on private land that was not his. And some white, six white hunters um, confronted him about this, and he shot and killed all six of them. Um, and this kind of set off, um, this was really interesting for me because it was, the, uh, it was the incident that I heard a lot about but there were also incidents of white hunters killing Hmong hunters. Like there just seems to be this like uh, like cycle of violence that is going on um, and has been going on for years um, that I really find like tragic and fascinating. Um, and that was kind of like the genesis for this piece. Great. So why don't you set up your excerpt yeah. for us? Um, so you have to pretend that I am an Asian American man in his twenties. His name is Pao. And he is talking to a class of, uh, of middle school students. Um, OK, so my name's Pow. You can call me Mr. P. That's cool if you want. Uh, Miss G is out moving her car, but she said I should probably get started. OK, so mom, everyone, they want to know what mom is. Every, everyone around here, they like, what the fuck? Excuse my mouth. But they like, fuck. <laughs> It's cold up in here, and we're all freezing our asses off, and there are these tropical Asians showing up. I thought we were all blonde up in here. So, I can tell you what Hmong is, but it's like real secret. Like, I'm gonna kill you secret. No shit. Okay, so, Hmong. We come from a bunch of different countries. We ain't got no, like, Hmong country, because I guess nobody likes us. Which I get. I don't like me either. Story of my life. And we're from all over. And we're in fucking China, and then fuck Chinese. No offense, nobody Chinese. Fucking Chinese. <laughs> so we go down to Laos and fucking Laos or Laotians. They're also like fuck you, and they try to kill us, but they can't because we're tropical survivors with the tigers and lions and flesh-eating monkeys. We hunt those dudes for breakfast. We eat tiger for breakfast. Tony the Tiger Cat, because we're CIA mother. You ever heard of this shit? About how the American government recruited Hmong guys to fight the Viet Cong for them. Because I guess Asian on Asian violence is cheaper. Oh, and we eat steak for the protein. We bite the shit out of them head first and swallow the whole thing up. They're like noodles to us. <laughs> steak, ramen. That's our Thanksgiving dinner. People are like, oh yeah, turkey. And we're like, oh yeah, steak. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. We don't really eat snakes. <laughs> we have big families, and we eat a lot. I figure that's like everyone else, but uh, what I know. <laughs> so, sitting next to Lauren is a very dapper Dominic Pinocchiaro. It was a beautiful, long Italian last name, so I feel like he is a kindred spirit. <laughs> Wednesday night at 7. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so doing some internet stalking of you, you said that you're interested in investigating pop culture and reality TV, and this is, this is a, a, you know, a questioning that you keep coming back to in your work. Can you please tell us a really embarrassing story or two about <laughs> pop culture obsessions from your past, perhaps when you were a kid or in junior high? Or, if you feel like there's nothing embarrassing about you, what are your favorite contemporary TV shows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I don't really believe in, yeah, in guilty pleasures. Right? I think I just, you know, I'm not ashamed, so. <laughs> no, so I, uh, I wrote a play uh, about a year ago about Justin Bieber. And so that started uh, as, a, as a purely scientific research. But by the end, I, was, I, had, I had kind of, Found what what I what people liked about Justin Bieber, so I was just what I was. Tell me. <laughs> you don't know. I can't. You know. I can't help you. <laughs> but uh, okay. And you said you said TV shows, guilty guilty pleasure TV yeah. shows. I mean, you know, the the Bachelor is kind of the tops, right? And anything on MTV, which yeah. is just. 
trash, but delightful, <laughs> glorious trash. <laughs> um, so your play contains some really fantastic, maybe disgusting, visceral stage directions that I love, that I'm really obsessed with. Um, or rather, descriptions of what we see on stage. We're not gonna give a lot of stuff away about the plays in this event, I hope. Um, that, at least for me, got me thinking about the sort of possibilities of the stage and what we can do theatrically, what we can do live in front of live people. Can you talk about um, what excites you about getting real or getting graphic on stage? I mean, I think as a theater maker, you have to take advantage of what makes theater unique as a medium in our world of TV and film and all you know, and all of the media we have surrounding us. And, and it's theater always comes down to that it is it is live. It is someone actually they are in the room with you, actually being present. So I feel like it's about in a certain way taking advantage of that, and then and also kind of then yeah, not shying away from the extremes there and not being afraid to kind of. To play in the in the murky, muddy kind of humanity. And again, it's all about this, this live experience. So we might as well really dig deep into the the humanness that makes us what we are on stage, and kind of share that with an audience and with the performers on stage. So yeah, that's kind of that's where I come from. Yeah. Why don't you set up your search box? Okay. <laughs> So this is, this character's name is Dina, and she is a 34-year-old contestant on a reality TV <coughs> game show. <coughs> Thank you for being a friend, mama, mama. Travel down the road and back again. Your heart is true, you're a pal and a confidant. And if you threw a party, <laughs> invited everyone you knew, you would see the biggest gift would be from me, and the card attached would say, "Thank you for being a friend." <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> you know, you ever think, you ever think we're like those old hags on Golden Girls, <laughs> <laughs> like young, beautiful versions of those old hags on Golden Girls? <laughs> Like, bitch is obviously the little one, but like, little witchy, tiny, zombie, near death, already dead one. <laughs> and Cindy's like Betty White, duh. Little dumb, stupid, brain dead Betty White. Doesn't know where she is half the time, Betty White. And you're like that slutty southern one. That like, trampy, kind of <laughs> sleazy one. The like, sex starved one with the accent. And I'm the Arthur, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> because I'm a badass. And I don't take any shit from anybody. And I just look at all you basic bitches and like <laughs> scowl, but in a pretty way. <laughs> I just look and scowl and judge you because you are all so silly, and I am the fucking hard for mm -hmm. <laughs> You ever think about that? Thought Golden Girls? <laughs> <laughs> My reading is Thursday night at 7 p.m. Okay. Um, so I found this really long, um, detailed, quite funny bio of you on the interwebs. <laughs> yes. And it sort of went through how you made a series of choices in your life. So how you chose theater over football, how you chose um, <laughs> acting over being a male escort, maybe, <laughs> and then about how you chose writing over acting, which is a great choice. And then, and then about how you ended up in LA to work in film and TV. Um, as theater people constantly faced with the lore of LA and living in a sunny place, um, tell us, if you could switch one thing about LA with one thing about New York City, what would you switch and why? The people. <laughs> Like LA, um, it's, and it's a, you just never get any honest conversation, yeah. and it's really hard to like meet people and have legitimate conversation. Uh, in New York, you can go inside of a bar and have like great conversation about arts and politics and religion and get real opinions. 
and in LA, it's uh, people are scared because they're always wondering who you are, who you could be, and could you employ them? So not. <laughs> um, and like, I go to restaurants, and I just, I just hate the people. <laughs> And it's really hard because I love that the quality of life is better. But, you know, and it's cliche to say it's superficial. Uh, but it's superficial. It, it is. It's, rare. It's, it's just upper layer. And so, like, I have no friends there. Oh, how long have you been there? Three years. Have you have a family there? I right? have a family. That's part of the reason. You have some friends. Yeah. Family. Like, I met one other guy. Because I could play dates. <laughs> So we were at a we were at a this little playground gymnasium for kids, and uh, this guy walks up to me. He's like, "Hey, check out that nanny. She's not even watching the kid." I was like, "Well, let's watch the kid then." And we started talking, and then all of a sudden, I was like, "You're not from here." He's like, "You're not from here. Are you from New York?" You're like, "That's why." <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was my first friend. So I have to write it when I get back. <laughs> So one of the things that I loved about your play um, was how beautifully you nail what it's like to be in a family of either all brothers or all sisters. I'm one of four girls in my family, so I felt like there was a lot to relate to in your in your play when it comes to that. Um, can you tell me what is unique about the relationship between brothers and um, how you came up with this trio of guys who are very different and yet you know are, are obviously such a part of one another? Well, it's uh, somewhat autobiographical in some, I should say, the positioning or the hierarchy. Uh, I'm the oldest, and so I have three younger brothers. Um, and since I was the first, like, this will actually clear it up. I was the vaginal birth, and the other three were C-sections. So like, <laughs> so that, if anybody knows, that's, the difference in some ways, because that means I was the chosen one who could fight through the tunnel, and my mom's like, nope, get him out, I just want him out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's like a lot of guilt. <laughs> because of it. Uh, so that's how the relationship kind of, you know, started in some ways, because I've always been that, and then of course because I was the oldest, I was really mean. My brothers, I, uh, I lost my father really young, so I became the man of the house. So I would beat them all up, up a lot. Uh, and I felt bad, I actually apologized to them like four years ago. And I was expecting for them to be really angry at me. But they, uh, they were like, no, you, made, you, you, you helped us be men. I was like, no, but do you understand? It's like, I wronged you. Yeah, I did some psychological damage. You are mean to your children because of me. And they're like, no, no, you did, you did the best you could. I was like, no, this isn't the. You're supposed to cry and drink, and you're supposed to punch me. That's how I run play. That's how I got it out. Set up your excerpt. Oh, so uh, this is the opening of the play. Uh, the oldest brother has been uh, traveling, after the mother committed suicide, the oldest brother left and has been traveling uh, to work at Natural Disasters. Uh, he, felt, he felt like if he could help people, he will explain his life. But he decides to come back after a five year absence to finally say goodbye to his mother and, and apologize to his brothers for who he's, he was. Uh, so this is the opening. Scene one, night, December 24th, a Cheech and Chong Christmas plays on the radio. A small light comes up on the dashboard. Eric ducks down in the passenger seat and digs through a grocery bag. He pulls out a package of kielbasa sausage and begins to unwrap it. I close my eyes and I try to remember what you were like and all I see is anger. Mouth open wide, yelling, hand raised, ready for a swipe. You were one tough lady, didn't take shit from no one. I know it wasn't easy having to raise three boys practically on your own, but that doesn't explain why you were absent. I play back my childhood memories, my victories, my defeats, my awards, and I can't find a single one where you were. Oh. Oh. Oh, you must have been there in the background, waving a pom-pom, holding a sign, wearing the school color, saying, that's my son. But looking back, I can't see your face in any of them. It's like you weren't there at all. Oh, oh. oh. shit. I do remember the rice with ground beef. That was good. <laughs> Spicy, I loved it when you made rice with ground, with ground. 
Shit. No, Hawk. Come on. No. Oh, man, no, I can't believe this. Of course this would happen to me. Why? Come on! Okay, relax. You can figure this out. You're nervous, so it's probably constricted. Relax. There you go. Okay, relax. Uh, 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 reach for it. Shit, I can't. You can figure this out. I can go home like this. Maybe I can push it out at a rest stop or on the John. <laughs> Sirens, a police car. No! Andrew walks up. He taps on the window. You all right? Yeah. Can you lower your window? Sure. Eric? Eric, is that you? Hey. <laughs> When'd you get back? You're a cop? Yeah. When'd you become a cop? Started the academy three weeks after you left. What are you doing back? Tomorrow's Christmas. I know what tomorrow is. Don't fucking start. I'm not starting anything. I'm just surprised you're the last person I thought I'd see out here. Yeah, well, I thought it was time to see her. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, what are some of the amazing ideas you've had while in the midst of those activities? Um, let's see. Well, my partner's also a playwright, Steve Moles. He's great. Um, he is great. Hi, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's watching on how. Yeah. And we, we really like to drive, like, far. Like, we drove, we take, like, baseball road trips, and we went to Pittsburgh to, like, watch a baseball game this year, so that was fun. Um, so we wrote this crazy serialized play last year in 12 installments. So every month we had to write like a new 15 minute play. Like, so it was like one month from like first draft to production. And so we had, you know, we had an overarching idea, you know, we had ideas for how it was all gonna play out. But I would say we, we took one road trip up to Cleveland to see Rich Girl by Tori Stewart, another awesome player. Right? Hi, Tori, if you're out there. <laughs> um, and, I th and, and, Cleveland, and there was a music box in the play, and we didn't really know why it was there. We knew there was a music box on stage. And on, on that trip to Cleveland, we figured out what the, what the music box meant. Very, very cool. <laughs> Um, so your fabulous play it loops and twists time in this really fantastic way that keeps us guessing and investing in your main character throughout it. Um, and in your application, you even included this wonderful graph of how the play is structured, <laughs> something I had never seen and really quite enjoyed. I'm really into PowerPoint. You are. <laughs> and she's really into math, right? Really into math. Yeah, yeah, I'm not like amazing at math, but I can do like middle school math, which I tutor. So. Better than me. Yeah. Better than me. Um, did, did you sort of set out to be formally daring when you wrote the play, or did did your story sort of demand it? Like, why did you choose to tell your story in this um, I actually feel like it's not formally daring, because it's like, <laughs> because it's, it's like comfort to me to have a structure to hang on to. So I think more daring would be like, no structure allowed, just let characters talk. And then I'm like, what? no, uh, there has to be some, like, a, a blueprint, so. So I don't know. It doesn't feel daring to me, but maybe it is. Did did structure come first or narrative come first? Like were you mm, kind of percolating? I think narrative came first. Narrative came first, for sure. Yeah, I had this like idea about the call center and getting a call and that structure came after. Right. Tell us about your play and about the excerpt you're about to read. Well, um, so my play takes place over several nights of insomnia. And so the main character, Ada, buys this like self-help document off the internet. And so she meets um, the doctor, Dr. Carol, who is, who is not, she's more, he, she's a specter, not, not really real. So this, this is between Ada and Dr. Carol, and Dr. Carol is trying to convince Ada to make a change. Dr. Carol will be over here, and Kate will be over here. <laughs> <laughs> I would advise you to leave. I haven't showered. Leave your job, Ada. 
make a radical change. Oh no, I can't do that. I call it a life vacation. It's a term I coined in my first document, vacationing life. <laughs> I can't afford to vacation my life. Once your mind is clear, your path will reveal itself. But I don't have any skills. You went to divinity school. That's not funny. <laughs> Was I being funny? Were you? I don't understand your sense of humor. You have a higher calling, Ada. I don't. We all do. But it's really hard to find work right now. When I moved here, I applied to 187 places. Retail, restaurant, tutoring, babysitting, pet sitting, data entry, warehouse. I said I could lift 50 pounds. I have no idea if I can lift 50 pounds. Like, how much is that? Like a 10 year old or a large dog? You applied to these jobs. Yes, 187 of them. That's where you went wrong. Never apply for a job, Ada. Apply yourself. <laughs> it's really hard to find work right now. Don't work. Live the life you love and get paid for it. <laughs> I'm not sure how to do that, which is why we're taking this journey together. I want to share some of myself with you. Fifteen years ago, I was living high on the hog. Corporate job, high six figures, intercourse with gorgeous men wearing expensive suits. But was I happy? Do you think I was happy? I'm guessing no. No, I was not. <laughs> So I left that job and that salary and those many, many sex partners and look at me now. I used to have wrinkles on my forehead. Where'd those wrinkles go, Ada? Where'd they go? I don't, those wrinkles stayed right where they belong, in the sphincter of corporate America. I made the change, Ada. So can you. Thank you, Diane. Next to Diana is the lovely Walter Gott from Boston, from lovely Boston, and his play is Chalk. When is your reading? My reading is on Friday at 7. Great. Um, so I hear that you once dislocated your shoulder. Can you tell me about that? Can you tell me that story? I can. Uh, Great. I'm not a very agile person, uh, and I was sitting with some friends watching a movie uh, while sitting on a bed. It was a captain's bed, in my defense, so it had drawers underneath it. Uh, and I made some smart ass remark and my friend playfully pushed me off the edge of the bed and I thought I was on the edge of the bed and I had a very clear moment where I thought I can either catch myself or I can carry this joke through to its logical conclusion and pretend to fall off the bed. And then discovered that gravity doesn't actually care if you're pretending or not. Because about halfway down I just started falling instead of pretending to fall and caught myself like this, and, uh, which was actually fine for about 30 seconds. Um, and it wasn't until I stood up and all my friends were asking if I was okay, and to prove that I was okay, I did this. Oh. That, <laughs> How's it doing today? It's a little clicky sometimes, but uh, it's, I think we're through the woods for the most part. <laughs> Thank you. Um, see, your play has a sort of science fiction sheen to it, we'll say. And um, in, in my reading, I would say that science fiction, though it's fantastic and outlandish and full of great things like spaceships, it actually tells us a lot about what it means to be human and about what our foibles are. Um, what is your relationship with or experience of science fiction? Deep <laughs> and, and thorough. Uh, I went to an all boys middle school <laughs> and, where we all wore coats and ties and uh, had aviator glasses and a cowlick and braces, and so um, was not the alpha male. Uh, <laughs> but I took, they had a, in sixth grade, they had a reading class, and um, uh, which was just part of the assignment was every week you had to read a book. And the professor whose name was Dr. Peebles, which is my favorite professor name in the world, uh, and he looked like a Dr. Peebles, had over 50 years of teaching middle school boys assemble this library in the back of the room that was all pulp science fiction fantasy novels. So it was Asimov and Bruce Colville and uh, Douglas Adams and just this whole sort of cornucopia of speculative fiction and fantasy novels. And so that became my sort of weekly reading. Uh, and that was, it's sort of stereotypical to say, but that was sort of the escape and that, and, and that was fun. Um, and it does, you know, I think something about 
sci-fi and, uh, and fantasy sort of lets you get out of your own experience enough to look back onto it and reflect on it and think about it and sort of unpack it in a safe space that also has lasers. Um, so uh, so it, it always played a really big role for me. And then in about eighth grade, the Star Wars Special Editions came out, and so I was like gone forever at that point. It was, uh, that was, it was sold at that point. And have, have you written plays that have to do with science fiction before? Um, I've written a, for you? I write a lot of genre plays. I think this is my first sort of hard sci-fi play. Um, I wrote one where a girl gets possessed by the internet, but that was more of like a sci-fi comedy. And then I've written a sort of a sort of high uh, high romance, swashbuckling farce. Like I like bouncing around to tropes and story styles because again, I feel like it sort of gives you a framework that you can tell a story within, um, where you can unpack the the themes of the story in a in a different setting, in a surprising setting. Can you set up your excerpt for us? Sure. Uh, so Chuck. Um, it's a mother and a daughter, so I wrote it for myself. <laughs> um, uh, the, it is set after an apocalyptic event. Um, the mother is inside of a chalk circle that's drawn on the ground, and her daughter has come back and has been trying to get the mother to talk, but has not been entering the circle. She's been staying outside of it. And so uh, I guess the, the daughter will be here, and the mom will be here, and we'll go from there. Don't tell me to shut up. I came back for you. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I fucking did, and I brought food, too. I brought it back for you, for both of us. But you're not back. What the hell are you talking about? It's me, with lots of food, and it'd be great if you thanked me just once, maybe, for it. Bring it here. What? Bring some food here for me. I thought you weren't hungry. Of course I'm hungry. I've been stuck in this circle for two weeks alone, so give me something. Don't throw it. Give it to me, hand to hand. Walk it over. Quiet. Throwing's not ladylike. Manners are a little outdated, Mom. Hand it over right here, now. No. I didn't think so. I don't have to prove anything. Yes, you do. You should be coming to me. Too bad, then. Stick your hand out, stick your hand in. I can't do that, why not? Because I want you to, no. And you know why. Because you're being a bitch is why, I think. Why do I have to do all the work? Because you're not her. Who am I? You're one of them. And you took her, and you're using her, and you're not her. I know my own daughter, and I want you to leave. Tough shit. I'm here for the long haul. Thank you all. So, well, it's Jenny Kokai, who wrote this fabulous play, Girl in Black. What is your reading, Jenny? Uh, I, my reading is Saturday at 3. Um, in your bio, which I also love, your frustrations with um, living in Utah are quite palpable. <laughs> uh, can you tell me, if you were in charge of Utah, if you were the president of Utah, how would you change it? Uh, well, there are many lovely things about Utah. Okay, so like, I should start with that, because I do feel like people probably are watching me on that camera from Utah. So I want to start. Start with the good. Yeah, so like, there are lots of lovely things about Utah. Um, I teach at the university there. My students are amazing, and my colleagues are amazing. Uh, and they are really lovely, uh, genuine people. Maybe the opposite of LA. Uh, they are so genuine that sometimes it hurts. Um, uh, let's see. Okay. Well, if I was the president of Utah, you could buy wine in the grocery store. Uh, if I was the president of Utah, there would be something to do on Sundays. Um, if I was the president of Utah, it would not snow so damn much. Um, I, I guess I'm the god of Utah now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think uh, Utah is a changing and developing state, so some things they gotta work out. But definitely wine in the grocery stores would be my number one thing. <laughs> um, so there, there are these wonderfully open scenes in the play in which you ask the actors and director to uh, create and stage their own memories, which uh, become very significant parts of the narrative for your, for your main character, for your two main characters. Uh, 
uh, why did you think it was so important for you to be open to your collaborators' processes, and why did you choose to structure it that way? Um, I think it goes back to what was already said about what theater can do that's different and better than all other art forms, <laughs> which for me, one of those things is collaboration. Every show is different, it's ephemeral, it changes, and I, um, some people really resist that and worry about that and like write lots of stage directions, but I sort of decided to lean into that. Um, so I was really interested in what would happen. So they're, uh, they're not staging their own memories, they're really specific memories that are there but they're just kind of described a little bit. And then I leave it up to them whether, however they want to interpret the memory, um, if it's through multimedia or improvisation or dance or I don't know, circus, dog tricks? I don't, I don't know how dog tricks would work. But um, I just, I really was curious what would happen if I made it so that every production would be its own unique thing and that they would be collaborating with me in a really active way and that's really exciting. Can you tell us more about your play, about the excerpt you're about to read um, Sure. So the bulk of my play takes place in this weird store filled with glowing glass jars that's open 24 hours a day. And the woman who's hired to work there is never allowed to leave. But if she stays for uh, a year and a half and works there, she gets, or I guess if she stays for a year, she gets a million dollars as long as she never leaves. Um, this scene um, is the delivery man who accidentally wanders into that store, uh, and he is in this weird space that's not quite, I guess it's kind of like limbo, and he meets a guy named Tom, and neither of them know what they're doing. So, uh, I'm starting with Tom. Uh, this conversation will be easier with music. It's easy to make that happen here, did you know? He snaps his fingers, music plays, he lights a cigarette. I've been here before. You're not the first guy. I'm very confused, that's Edgar. Uh, that's because of the jar. Put down the jar, Edgar does. It's best that you never visit truly again. But I, you don't. How do you know? I've been here before. You love her too. You want her for yourself. Ugh, it always goes this way. I'm gay, and even if I wasn't, the last thing I'd want is truly. Why are you here then? What do you want? You're carrying my jar. I want my jar back. Give it back and don't touch it again. I'm sorry. He pushes over the jar with his foot. Careful. What's in it? That's none of your business. Okay. Actually, I don't know. I just know it's mine. Oh, why are you yelling at me then? It's important. I know that. We could open it. You can't just open it. There are a lot of rules about this jar of whatever. Yes, truly knows what's in it. How does truly know? That's her job, you should ask her. Who are you, have we ever met? No, but I feel like we have business together. Me too, is there something you need delivered? I don't think so. That's my line of business, delivering things. What things? All kinds of things, almost. What do you do? I'm a writer, a good one? <laughs> Maybe once, I haven't written anything in a very, very long time, oh. In fact, I should say I'm a drinker. That's what I do now, mostly. <laughs> Can you be a professional drinker? <laughs> I'm giving it a go. <laughs> Although, I still put words on the page and hope they add up more to letters than letters soaked in gin. Do they? Nope. But a little more gin, my brain clicks over and I don't care. You snap your fingers here, you get music. I haven't figured out yet how to snap my fingers and get a remote fizz. <laughs> write them and direct them and translate them into Korean. Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to know what are some of the toughest translation hurdles you face? Like I, I noticed that you translated Evil Dead the musical <laughs> into Korean. I'd love to know sort of how you, you know, if there are any funny stories from making those, oh my God. those musicals I alive for me. <laughs> <laughs> or terribly sad. <laughs> by uh, the writers of Man of La Mancha because they thought our jokes weren't funny. 
She got cancer somewhere in the knees, had to get them both chopped off, the cancer and the knees. Not that it helped. Still thinks the worst thing about being legless is that she can't kneel down to pray. So, when I announced that I'm headed for the Gulas and my ties of the West Sun, all she said was, be safe, okay? I said I'd bring back a grandchild for her, would she mind boy or girl or something in between? She said, oh, oh, how about those macadamia nut things covered in chocolate? <laughs> are they? I'm thinking, serves me right, abandoning your legless mom to go catch a frog. I'm thinking, yeah, this right here is the rest of the trip. My smallness wedged between the world's rude largeness. There's no way I'll ever budge from my small, stupid seat. And then I start to feel funny. Count the dates and realize, yay, that's raining. <laughs> <laughs> to my right, dreaming marine. To my left, the Pacific. What to do? Stay put, and soon we'd both be sitting in a pool of blood. They want to go practically and leave me. Climb out of my gorge, and I might break him or wake him, or and you know he looked so peaceful. So what's it going to do? This is what I do: find the tampon, slide hand into pants, all of which are expertly concealed by coat and blanket. Then slowly, silently, with the focus of Mr. Miyagi, <laughs> <laughs> pop the sucker in. <laughs> 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 All this in the confines of 25A, y'all. The autonomy of taking care of personal needs in public spaces. That's a <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I can do this. I could go to the fucking Maui. <laughs> about feeling like you have to sort of sneak up on what you're writing. You always sort of look at it out of the side, out of, out of your peripheral vision. And, and I think to do that, I, I do a lot of walking around, riding the train, listening to music, and then when, actually, when I'm actually writing, I'll write a couple pages in this space. So I sort of walk circles around my house, and I have a lot of little toys on my desk that I just sort of play. It's very cat-like. You just kind of <laughs> pull it out. Yeah, a lot of toys. <laughs> I have a question for the group that, that I've already asked. Well, I'm going to answer again. But if, if the essence of, of your playwright to play was a meal, what meal would that be? <laughs> what meal would that be? In case anyone didn't hear, that's a great question. Of this play? Yeah. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> You know that really creepy nursery rhyme about the pie with all the blackbirds in it? That. <laughs> you're like, oh, it's pie. It's not pie. It's birds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a, a half-eaten banana that you like that you can barely eat. Like, have you ever like really not been hungry? Because I'm like always hungry, but. When I 
at one time when I was like truly not hungry. It was like scary, like I couldn't finish this banana. So yeah, the unfinished banana. <laughs> classic, classic. We're all going really appetizing. <laughs> <laughs> Mine is a can of cold baked beans. No. I think. play was written as sort of a patchwork of a few different events and figuring out now that they're all stitched together where the questions are about the rules of the world and how things work now and what means what and what's important for the audience to know is something that I'm listening for uh, and working with the actors and, and the director uh, to suss out and sort of tighten them, just kind of smoothing down the rough edges. I think my, because my play is like a ghost story and there's like these multiple layers of like past and present, um, like what I'm really, really trying to figure out is like the rules of the world and how everything operates. Um, and I think what's great about like this process of the LARC is that um, they acknowledge that your play is going to be in, in many different places and that um, we're not presenting these plays as like, like we are done, please produce them, although that could be great too. Um, we we are we are allowed to kind of present where we are at this point in time, um, and so I think that takes a lot of pressure off of making the ten hours about like putting up like a polished reading, um, so much as like a check in. Yeah, I mean I think with ten hours you can either do one of two things: is on the big scheme is either 
use the ten hours to like sort of sculpt it. If the play is there, it's so sort of like take out the needless words and like insert funnier jokes, or you could like blow it up and do something completely not the play that you wanted to do, um, and and like see what happens because you have the resources and you have the people who will read them and give you feedback. And I think that's the, that's the best way to get uh, understanding of what you've just done to the play is to like, just have people do them, uh, have the actors embody them and try them out. Um, and I, I don't know, we had this whole conversation during Venna about what our goals are. It seems like a lot of us are going towards like, trying to um, try things and dig deeper. And that's, that's pretty exciting. There's a lot of room for risk. Yeah. yeah. There's just a lot of room for risk, which is fun. Yes. Okay. Uh, you were a doctor. You had a friend who was dying of a rare disease. It doesn't even have to be a rare disease, but you had no other patients who had that disease to study. And the dilemma you faced was: do you inject yourself with the disease? or do you go on to something else okay, so to study it? The question is, if you, if you were a doctor and your friend was dying of a rare disease, would you infect yourself with that disease in order to help your friend be cured? Is it your friend or a patient? How good of that? Doesn't happen. <laughs> do I have interns? <laughs> studying the effects on you when you come out alive and find out a way to treat them. What if you don't come out alive? <laughs> <laughs> you do come out alive. So you say you come out alive. Oh. And you oh, yeah, totally. you're guaranteed to come out alive. <laughs> <laughs> This is the most condensed work that's been done on it. Yeah, I, I can't even begin to say. I don't know. I feel like I've, it's always the document by kind of being in movement until someone needs it, someone outside, and then kind of <laughs> redate it, you know, and do a couple more things. So. Yeah, I, I still know. put numbers on it. I, I just do like for my go, or uh, the one way they have sex. Or <laughs> <laughs> Just the word. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so Austrian. So Austrian. I would <laughs> translation. Yeah, yeah. So it was really even one more level. So um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you said about being collaborative and to an extent that is in your place and what kinds of variations you can think of that would come out of leaving that door open? Sure. Um, I do have one choice. So um, <laughs> there's that. And, and character names. Um, I have seen the memories done as hip hop dance um, that was worked in some places for me and didn't work in other places. Um, I think I think I hesitate to answer the question just because it's really exciting to sort of know that I can't dream up all of the weird things that could be done. I mean, I guess you could do them with like shadow puppets. Puppets are always awesome. Um, <laughs> animation. Uh, so I think the great thing is not knowing, right? I mean, you're it's mostly the mise en scène that's open. No, I mean, it's everything. So the memories, now I really feel like I should have read a memory. But um, they're just sort of a description of memories. They're actually other people's memories. I um, stole them uh, with people's permission. So I put a thing up on Facebook, and I was like, what is a memory that you would either really want to keep forever or you would never want to remember again? And so people gave them to me, and so they're in the play. Uh, and they're just sort of described um, like, their colors and their images and their the meanings of them, but there isn't action or dialogue or character. So you're saying there's parts of the play. Yeah, oh, just oh, little chunks. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so it's like what? Is yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's uh, I think like 18 scenes and seven memories or something. So oh, it's the okay. memories are open. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. This is for uh, Uncle. In your bio, you say that you also a director. Uh, how has that influenced your writing? And also, to the rest of the panel, if you have directed or active, has that, how has that also influenced your writing? How does directing influence your Oh, um, I started off as a director um, in Korea. I was uh, assistant director in directing. Then I came to school here for directing at first. And I think as a playwright, <coughs> probably was a pain in the ass for the director. <laughs> It, it took a hard, it took a while for me to just sort of let it go, and now I think I'm beginning to actually let that influence my work and, and um, more letting myself visualize the things that I'm writing and like see it first because that's how I'm trying and then the feel, make sure that I'm open about other people's interpretations. But I think, I mean, when I actually acknowledge that and opened up to, actually it's fine if you're staging it as you're writing it, um, it just makes it more detailed and more, you know, I, I, that's how I understand it. So I think um, as much as you can, <laughs> I mean if you're a designer and a writer, though you have to let your strengths influence uh, what you're making. So, and also I was a musical theater director which somehow makes my plays musical. I think there's always a song and ditty somewhere Does anyone else want to tackle the direction question? I, I mean, I direct too, um, and I think maybe that's part of the reason that I don't put a lot of stage directions in, is because I know that when you direct, you want to honor the playwright's vision, but if it's really prescriptive, it can be um, I'm not as exciting maybe. So uh, leaving things open for interpretation, but it, I guess it's like a compromise, right? Leaving things open for interpretation, but not um, leaving it to where, you know, you, you never want to be those directors who's like, Romeo and Juliet in space, right? So it's a compromise position. <laughs> yeah, I think that you, you're writing a script, but like you're not writing the script for the audience. You're writing yeah. the script for the people you're going to be putting the play together with. And so I did, I've did. i done acting and directing, and I feel like they, doing those things, although I like writing so much better, taught me how to talk to directors and actors and write in a way that hopefully will get those artists excited yeah. about the challenges in the play and sort of help help build that collaboration. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Hi, I have a question for Diana. Um, can you explain more about what you, what you meant by you need to be in motion when you actually felt like you got some of your best writing done? Is being in motion or having something going on around you? How does being in motion help you? Yeah. Um, I think it's 
vegan motion help day in the right? Um, I, something that's a challenge, a huge challenge for me as a writer is that I am an extrovert and I really like being around people and so like being alone and writing is actually like awful and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think road trips, road trips are like unique in that I am often alone but I'm going somewhere to like hang out with people. So, and sometimes I'm in the car with one other person. Um, so these moments between, between like, what is, it's like a moment before the treat of getting to hang out. And so then like, it's like a, a time that it's for myself and I can sort of think about all sorts of ideas. And that's true about like walking briskly or running or exercise or whatever that I can, I, that's like a good moment to be alone because I'm like productive and alone and I'm not just like sad. <laughs> I hope that was clear. Thank you guys so much for staying and doing this and thank you all.